Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my March 2022 reading wrap-up. If you're not already aware, I do weekly entertainment wrap-ups of everything I read, watch, and listen to, but today we're just talking about the books. I'm going to start with my nerdy hardcore stats and charts and then get into what I read. Also, I put chapter markers in all my videos, so if there's a book that you need to revisit, just check down below. On the way there, make sure that you're subscribed to me and click that bell notification in case it actually does anything. In March, I read 14 books for a total of 4,558 pages. That takes into account converting audiobook minutes to pages, so 1,777 of those pages were actually about 54 hours of audio. The age breakdown for these books was 12 adult books and 2 YA books. I read 11 novels, 2 graphic novels, and 1 anthology. This month, the biggest chunk of what I read was nonfiction and historical fiction, followed by contemporary, romance, mystery thriller, and poetry. If you adjust by page count, you realize one of those romance books was huge. Most of these books were from the library, but I also read some from NetGalley, a publisher, Borrowed, an independent bookseller, and a book box. I read five audiobooks, four paperbacks, three ebooks, and two hardcovers. The biggest chunk of my books were in the 200 to 399 page range, and I had books published in three different decades. The majority of these books were written by female authors, and there was variety when it came to the protagonist's genders. In terms of setting, this was a big USA month, but I also had books set in the UK, Mexico, and other worlds. In terms of diversity of subject matter, the biggest chunk didn't have notable diversity, but others had to do with race, sexuality, mental health, or were intersectional. In terms of star ratings, this month I had two 3.5 star reads, six 4 star reads, three 4.5 star reads, and three 5 star reads. Let's start with our lowest rated read and work our way up to the highest, shall we? This is a little bit of a side note, but I know that when I do my best and worst books of 2022 video at the end of the year, I'm going to be very crushed that I had to talk about a 3.5 star book as the worst book for March. Starting off with my lowest rated 3.5 star read, we have Jane, A Murder by Maggie Nelson. This is a book written in poetry about the author's aunt, who she never actually met because her aunt Jane was murdered before she was born. She ended up finding an old journal of Jane's and kind of pieced together a little bit of her life before she was murdered, and mostly she's left wondering what happened to her aunt because the murder hadn't been solved. However, around the time this book was going into publication, they made an arrest, and there's actually a second book all about that, I just haven't picked it up yet. However, I've been really into true crime recently, and I know that I'm going to need to pick it up, even though poetry is one of those things where I feel like it should speak to me more than it actually does. I don't get as much from poetry as other people seem to get from poetry, so it's one of those things where I pick it up and I'll enjoy it, but I won't love it. But I still want to know what happened. My other 3.5 star read was The Death of Jane Lawrence by Caitlin Starling. I know this author because of The Luminous Dead, which is another book I've read by her. And that book has some similarities to this book, but it is definitely not the same overall. This book is set in a world that's kind of like Victorian England, but it's not our Victorian England. So there are certain societal expectations, but some of them have been done away with. For example, our main character Jane, and no I didn't put both of these books as 3.5 star books because their protagonists were named Jane. Her parents died during a previous war, so she's been living with family friends, and those family friends are actually moving back to where she used to live with her family, and she doesn't want to go there because of the memories associated with that place. But the only way for her to stay in town is either them supporting her, which she doesn't want, or her getting married. She decides to do the second, kind of looks around town and finds somebody she figures she could marry, and they would just have basically in a political alliance, it wouldn't be a love match, she just wants somebody to marry her so she doesn't have to move. However, in this version of this society, women are allowed to work, have careers, and that's basically what she wants out of her time. The man she picks to propose to is new to town, and he's a doctor, and at first he's very hesitant, but once he realizes that she doesn't want a love match, he's like, okay, yeah, I guess we can do this. You would be very beneficial to my practice, as she would also work at it as his accountant. And he goes, okay, but I have some weird terms. I live at my family's estate, but you're never allowed to go there. And she's like, sure, whatever, I don't care. I just want to be able to stay in town. It's fine. However, on their wedding day, there is a mix-up. She ends up having to go with him to the family estate. She's not supposed to stay the night. She ends up accidentally having to do so, and weird things go from there. 
This one is great in that it's creepy and atmospheric, which is definitely something it shares with the Luminous Dead. This character also spends a lot of time by herself, and you don't always know if what she's experiencing is real, which is another thing that shares with the Luminous Dead. Overall, this one was just creepy and fun to listen to. On to my four star reads, the first one being How to Be Ace by Rebecca Burgess. This one is a graphic novel about the author's time growing up, realizing she's ace, realizing what that means, and that it's completely fine. I liked the art in this, I liked the discussions, and there was something that was just very wholesome about this book. Next we have The Gamble by Kristen Ashley, which is apparently also the first in a series. This is a book I picked up for the 12 challenge, and I didn't know anything going into this book. I guessed, based on the cover, that it was probably going to be romance, and it was. I also got this from my library as an ebook, so I actually had no idea how long it was, but as soon as I started reading it, I realized that this was probably a very long romance book if I were to read it in page count, and when I looked up the official page count, I realized it was 629 pages. So yes, very long for a romance book, however this did have a mystery subplot, so I can see how we got that many pages. In any case, this one follows a woman named Nina. She's in her mid-30s and she has decided to take a break from the relationship she has with her fiancé in the UK to go for two weeks in a cabin by herself in Colorado. She is American, but she's been living in the UK because she used to have family there, and that is all explained throughout this. Upon arriving in a snowstorm at this cabin, she finds out that there was a scheduling error and she's not actually supposed to be there, and she's been traveling for 17 hours straight. She does not have her head on straight, she's starting to feel like she's got a cold coming on, and she's just very pissed that she has apparently prepaid for this thing and she's not going to get to stay there and she has to just go to a hotel in town in this very small town. So she leaves to try to do that and is basically stopped from doing that, and this man she meets at the house ends up having to take care of her. From there we meet this whole cast of characters. This is a very small town where everyone seems to know everyone else, so she ends up meeting all of these different people, kind of trying to figure out how they work in Max's life, because that's the guy whose cabin she's staying at. And then also someone turns up murdered and we have to figure out what happened there. This fulfilled a lot of great romance tropes and I loved it for that. However, Max needs to learn boundaries. There were certain things where she'd be like, no, don't do this, and he'd keep doing it. And I'm just like, okay, I understand that you're trying to put a crack in her shield because she's got a very big shield because of things that have happened in her past and that type of thing. At the same time, somebody tells you no, that means no. So like, stop doing the thing, but keep talking to her or whatever it is. He doesn't know what boundaries are, he really needs to learn them. I did end up liking them as a couple, they did seem to fit together for very specific reasons. However, this level of mountain man machismo is just so frustrating. Oh look, the sun is coming back. I love how inconsistent the sun is in all of my videos. Next we have Chef's Kiss. This is another graphic novel about this guy who has just graduated from university and is trying to find jobs in his field. He would love to be an editor of books, that type of thing. He's got an English degree, that's what his parents always wanted for him. However, every time he goes out for an interview, everybody's like, oh, you don't have any paid experience. No, I'm sorry, you can't get a job. This becomes really frustrating to the point where he even applies to be a garbage man, and because he doesn't have an experience being a garbage man, he is also turned down for that. He's walking down the street feeling very dejected, and he sees this cafe that has a help wanted, no experience necessary sign on it, and he goes, okay, perfect, a place that doesn't need experience. So he goes in there, meets this very hot sous chef, and this very weird head chef, and basically has to go through this trial period where he has to jump through a lot of hoops to find out if he is qualified to work at this establishment. Meanwhile, he has to lie to his parents and say that he did find a job in publishing because that's what they want for him and obviously that's a secret that's going to come out at some point. This was adorable, had some very fun side characters and some very fun side character moments and I definitely recommend it. Next we have The Roughest Draft. This is one I actually did an unboxing and reading vlog for, so I'll be sure to link that down below. I got this one from Once Upon a Book Club, which meant I had a number of things that I got to open at certain parts of the book, and that is always fun, so if you're interested, like I said, that is linked down below. This book is about two authors who used to be a writing duo, but four years previously they broke up and nobody really knows why. Now they realize they're still on contract for one last book, so they have to figure out whether or not they're going to be able to work together to fulfill that contract. 
Through this book we get the current timeline as well as the past timeline to try to figure out what led to them no longer being a duo. What's interesting is the plot of the book that they're writing together has to do with a breakup and a divorce and it has flashbacks to when their life was good as well so there's a lot of parallels between our story and that story. And it turns out that these writers communicate a lot in what they're writing as opposed to what they're actually saying to each other. What makes this book even more special is it is also written by a writing duo who happens to be a married couple. If like me you really enjoy your bookish books this is something you're going to want to pick up. Next we have Let Me Hear a Rhyme by Tiffany D. Jackson. And this is a book from her backlist and this one was actually set in I believe the 1990s. Following the unsolved death of their friend Steph, two friends as well as Steph's sister decide to band together and see if they can get him a record deal based on the songs that he's already written because that was always his dream and they really want that for him. However, there's obviously going to be challenges in this in that he is already deceased. Steph's sister also only agrees to this plan because she figures she can use the money from selling albums to hire a private detective to try to figure out what happened to her brother. We get this book from the three perspectives of these friends who are trying to help Steph, as well as some flashback chapters from Steph's perspective as well. I really enjoyed this. I love anything where people have a passion for a certain subject matter. In this case, it's music. It was also fascinating to see the grieving process of this group of friends and the people around them, and overall it's just a very solid read. Finally for this category we have The One True Me and You. This is a book that takes place over a weekend at two separate conventions that are happening at the same Orlando hotel. Especially because it's set in Orlando, it really made me miss BookNetFest. I really want BookNetFest to be a thing again and for me to be able to go to it and people to be able to travel again. One of our perspectives is Kaylee. They are a fan fiction writer and they are going to a convention for one of their favorite shows for which they write a lot of very popular fan fiction. They're also meeting up with their fan fiction friends from online as well as their in-person best friend. And there's a writing competition portion of this convention and they would really love to win that. Our other perspective is a girl named Tegan. She is actually at a beauty pageant and she's really hoping to finally win this one so she can cement the fact that she will have a scholarship for college and then after that she can finally come out of the closet because she knows if she does that before she wins anything big she's not going to win in the future. She is also a really big fan of The Great Game which is the convention that is happening at the same hotel and kind of sneaks off incognito to kind of blend into that crew and obviously she and Kaylee meet up and things go from there. This one was sweet and nerdy and convention loving and I loved it for that. I also thought that the way that this came up with having one central antagonist was really really clever and if this one isn't on your radar it definitely should be. It just came out this month and I highly suggest reading it. On to my 4.5 star reads, the first one being Velvet Was the Night by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This one takes place in Mexico in the 1970s and has two perspective characters that don't actually know each other. One of our perspective characters goes by the code name of Elvis and he is in a gang that has ties to the government. Something goes wrong on an assignment and then he's given a new assignment to track down this one specific girl. Our other perspective character is a woman who works in an office. She kind of just has a boring life and one day the woman that lives across the hall from her and her apartment complex says, hey, I'm going out of town for a couple of days. Can you watch my cat? She of course agrees to this because she could definitely use the money and she knows this girl is rich so she's kind of upped her price a little bit. However, when the girl doesn't come back when she says she's going to come back, she now has to track her down so she can get her money. Now we have two very different characters trying to find the same person for very different reasons and they both get mixed up in a political scandal. If audiobooks are your thing, this is definitely one I recommend because the voice actor did a very good job of using different tones for the two main characters but then also different character voices for all of the side characters and I was just very much impressed with that because there are a ton of different people and she came up with some excellent character voices that weren't hokey or weird or anything like that they just kind of fit for what was happening in the story. It was also very fun to see these two worlds colliding and then seeing where they might go from there. Next on my list is Devil House by John Darnell. If you're a particular fan of audiobooks read by the author this is one of those. You might know that name because because he has a couple of other books out that I've also read, but you might also know that name because he is the front man of The Mountain Goats. From what little I've heard of it, his music is very poetic and that definitely is reflected in his prose as well. This book follows a true crime writer as he moves into a house where decades previously something terrible happened and he's trying to figure out how to write a story about that. 
While he's doing that, however, he also tells us about a previous book that he worked on that was a huge hit and ended up in there being a movie adaptation and all of that type of thing. From that, we start seeing some parallels between that hit and the story he's trying to tell now. We also see him interviewing different people that had something to do with this house that didn't used to be a house. It started out as a restaurant, and then it was a newspaper stand, and then it was an adult video store, and then terrible things happened there, and nobody's actually really lived there since. You can also see this writer really trying to get into the minds of the people that previously inhabited this space, and what that might have looked like, and why they might have done the things that they did. This one also ends in a very interesting way that has some commentary on true crime stories, and the ones that are told, and the ones that are not. While I was listening to this, I do admit that there were some parts where I was wondering how things would all tie together, and they eventually did. However, there were certain parts that just kind of drew this book out a little bit longer than I needed personally. Last for this section we have Cruelly Yours Elvira, Memoirs of the Mistress of the Dark by Cassandra Peterson. In case you weren't aware, Elvira is a character, it's not actually her name. Elvira is one of those characters where even though I've never seen her show and I've never seen her movies, I know this character, I know of this character. She's had a huge cultural impact. Cassandra was born just over 70 years ago in a small town and didn't have a great upbringing. She definitely fought a lot with her mother. When she was very young, a pot of boiling water also spilled all over her, so she has burns on about 30% of her body. And by the time she became a teenager, she got really into music and really into going to concerts and then sneaking backstage at those concerts, meeting the people that were doing the concerts, and oftentimes getting very friendly with the people behind those concerts, as you will read many times in this book. After watching Viva Las Vegas starring Elvis Presley, she decided that she wanted to be a Las Vegas showgirl, so that's what she did when she was 17. She also became a singer, an improviser, a sketch comedy queen. She can do it all. And then, after all of that, she became Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. I learned so much about this woman that I had previously not thought about at all, and now I really need to watch her movies. She's also made friends or enemies with so many celebrities that just reading this, you're just like, how do you know all of these people? One that really impacted me though is she was good friends with Phil Hartman, and I know how his life ended, so I knew that was going to have to be a part of this book, and that was a little bit hard to read. If you're at all interested in this icon, I definitely recommend reading this book. On to my five star reads, the first one being another memoir by another icon, and that's The Storyteller, Tales of Life and Music. This one is by Dave Grohl, who is a man that I didn't really know much about previously. I know that my roommates have Foo Fighters tickets for October, and they're very excited about it. I know that they think Dave Grohl is a really cool person, and after reading this book, I have to agree. Also, it was only a few days ago that we heard about the passing of Taylor Hawkins, who is somebody I learned about through this book, so I felt very connected to that in that moment. In case, like me, you're not really a music person and you don't really know music people, Dave Grohl has been the frontman of the Foo Fighters for like 25 years. Before that, he was also one of the members of Nirvana. Before that, he was also in several other bands, and this book details going through all of that to get to where he is today. This dips into him learning how to play different instruments and then also teaching his kids, which was a cute little addition. It also has to do with his time touring in several different places and how he met different music music acts, and how they would come together, and how at one point he was recording albums for two different bands and drinking way too much coffee, which resulted in the video called Fresh Pots, which millions of people had seen before I had seen it, and then I had to go look it up because it was referenced in the book. Dave definitely seems like the type of dude I would like to go for a beer with. We don't connect on every level. There were a couple of things where I was just like, okay, that's the way that you look at the world. That's fine. But ultimately, at this point in my life, I hope he's just doing okay right now. Penultimately, I have another non-fiction book, and that is Conversations with People Who Hate Me by Dylan Marin. I have been such a fan of Dylan since he was cast as Carlos on the Welcome to Night Vale podcast. Then I started watching his YouTube videos and eventually started listening to the podcast that shares a name with this book. This book is broken down into 12 different lessons he's learned while he's done this podcast. The premise of this podcast is Dylan goes through different people that have sent him hate on the internet and gets them to come on his podcast and talk about what they wrote, 
why they wrote it, and basically for these people to get to know each other and where each other was coming from. After the first season, he branched out and he made it so that other people who have experienced hate online can come together with those people and have conversations that he moderates. You don't need to know all this backstory going into it because Dylan goes through it so clearly and with such vulnerability and passion for this project. And I just very much enjoyed seeing all of this work that he did behind the scenes and what it meant to do it via microphone and on camera at some point. Like I said, this goes through things he learned. It also talks about things that he has regretted doing in his time and just the, how he wants to do better. And this was just a fascinating way to look behind the scenes of this process. My favorite book that I read this month was a mystery thriller called The Girls in the Garden by Lisa Jewell. This one was actually recommended by Leanne over at Literary Diversion. She just raved about it in a video and I went, okay, if my library has it, I'm going to have to read it and I'm very glad I did. This one has to do with a mom and her two small children moving into this new place in London that actually opens up into this big community garden in the background. So everybody whose estates open up onto this basically shares this communal property. At the beginning of the book, we find out that something happens to one of the girls on that property, and then we go back in time about six months to see how we got there. Our perspective characters are the younger sister of the girl that gets attacked, her mother, and then the mother of other sisters in this area. This is a book that has so many suspects, and it really has you wondering who could have possibly done this. We are given so many suspects, so many motives, backstory to things that have happened in this area before come into play. This was just thrilling. I wanted to know what happened so badly. Every time I really started to cement a suspicion, something would be thrown in there to make me go, mm, am I on the right track? This of course means that I'm going to have to read more by this author, so if you have read anything else by Lisa Jewell and you would recommend it, please do so down below. If you want to hear me talk more about these books, or other books for that matter, the playlist for my weekly entertainment wrap-ups is always linked down below. It is a playlist of over a thousand books, over five years of me talking about books, so there's tons of different books that I would recommend or not. If you've read any of the books I mentioned in this video, let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment, but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a coffee account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that is also down below. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye.